Hi Danny Grace and Jude, this is the exercise guide. Now without a doubt, managing exercise with type 1 diabetes is probably the biggest challenge you're going to face. There's so many variables to throw in and plan for that makes it quite challenging to get in target glucose control. It's going to require a lot of continual tinkering, trial and error and failing and actually getting some successes. So don't expect things to work perfectly the first time, but if you've got a good underpinning knowledge of why things happen, it makes making better decisions much easier. So in this introduction, I'm going to walk through what are the key things you need to think about when planning for exercise, and then we'll do separate um, videos for aerobic exercise, mixed exercise, high intensity exercise, and then we'll pull it all together um, to, at the end. So let's have a look. So the first thing you need to think about is the activity that I'm going to do, is it aerobic exercise or endurance exercise? One steady pace that generally makes the glucose level drop down. Now all these graphics tell you the same thing. You might just prefer a certain one, but this shows aerobic exercise generally makes the glucose level drop. Same here, glucose level drops with aerobic activity, glucose drops with aerobic or endurance activity. We're in a 10K, going for a bike ride, going for a long walk, anything that is one paced that generally brings a lot of glucose out of the blood. At the opposite end, you've got anaerobic, short, sharp, intense activity that often makes the glucose level actually go up and spike. Sprinting, weightlifting, judo, things like that. You can see the glucose level will often increase in the short term, and we'll explain why that is. Or is it team sports? Is it mixed activity such as football, netball, basketball that's got elements of short, sharp, intense sprints that might make the glucose level go up? And then periods of relaxed sort of getting back into position, aerobic stuff where the glucose level comes down. Often the glucose level will stay very steady during these activities, but if they're really intense competitive activities, you might go high. If they're more relaxed, chilled activities, you might go low. So they're generally the ones that are hardest to keep a, a pin on because you don't know whether they're gonna go higher or lower and takes quite a bit of trial and error. So the first question is, are we gonna be doing aerobic activity, mixed activity, or anaerobic? Are we doing endurance, team sports, or very intense activities? And then the first thing you, you'll know then is, is the glucose level, level, level likely to go up, go down, or stay in target? Now the reason why the glucose level generally tends to drop during um, aerobic activities and endurance activities is because what we've learned in the activity section. When you do a level of exercise that is aerobic and endurance, then often a side door to the muscle cells opens up that allows more glucose to leave. So you get double the glucose leaving the blood, therefore the level will generally tend to drop. However, when you do intense activity that really gets the stress hormones flowing, you get the stress hormones flowing from the brain, they go to the liver, and all the stored glucose that's in the liver gets pushed out into the blood faster than it can get taken up into the cells. That's because the stressful situation is perceived by the brain. There's a perceived need to really move fast and liberate a lot of energy. Glucose stored in the liver has a lot of energy, therefore a lot of it's pushed into the blood, and therefore it can't be kept up by pushing, well, by enough going out into the cells. People without type 1 diabetes, interestingly here, when you look at what happens to their insulin levels, when they have a very stressful event such as this, their pancreas kicks out a lot more insulin so it can move more glucose across. And that'll give you an idea of what strategies we can use when intense activities make your glucose level go higher. One really important question here is, when did you have your last meal and insulin before the activity? So, if the activity was done very soon after um, the, the meal, within an hour, which is such as here, if no bolus insulin reduction is made and the full insulin is given, you're gonna have a lot of problems because we already know if you, when you give insulin and you do exercise, it pushes that insulin around to the muscles so it gets there faster and works faster. And we also said that with more blood flow to the muscles, insulin is only broken down by the liver and the kidneys. So it hangs around for a lot longer. So not only does it work faster, it works stronger and lasts longer as well. So here, by the effect of doing exercise for an hour, um, after an hour, only an hour after eating, you've got the double effect of the insulin with the exercise, which means that the glucose level will start to go really low and is gonna require a lot of dextrose or glucose, not only during the activity, but also afterwards. And that is a really difficult situation to manage if you don't reduce the insulin 
before um, when when you're having exercise within an hour or so or even a couple of hours afterwards. If you do do a 50% reduction, you manage to reduce the insulin, you will get a much improved situation. So here it's the same exercise done an hour after eating, but this time you can see the insulin dose has been halved. Yes, unfortunately, the glucose level probably will go a little bit higher at the start of the exercise, but the effect of the exercise by making that insulin supercharged and also opening the side doors brings the glucose level back down nicely. This is a safer and better situation than this situation where you could have a nasty low that you might not even recognize during exercise. So if you're going to be doing exercise, certainly within 90 minutes of exercise, um, of eating and giving insulin, you're going to be looking to reduce that insulin dose. Now, the amount that you reduce it down, 50% is a good place to consider, but we'll get into a little bit more nuance when we get into the different types of activity. But just that have in your mind, if you're doing activity within 90 minutes of eating, you're probably going to need to reduce that insulin dose, otherwise you're going to go really low. I want to take you here to um, one of my most challenging days with exercise and diabetes management is when I did the three peaks and it's all because of insulin timing issues. So I was told by the guide at seven o'clock in the morning that we're going to start at 9.30. So it's going to be two and a half hours after I had breakfast. So I decided to give the full bolus, which is here. Pretty sensible because most of the insulin after two and a half, three hours would have gone and I could have just managed with the extra glucose. However, they changed their mind and we decided we're now going to start off at 8.15 a.m., which is only an hour and 15 minutes after I'd had breakfast and given the full dose. You can see here. Now, I knew what was going to happen. So what I had to do was pile in an absolute shed load of glucose over the next three hours while I was walking. I think something to the tune of about... I want to say 90 grams of carbohydrate, which was 30 dextrose tablets over this period of time to keep up with the fact that this activity of walking up the hills was supercharging this insulin that I'd had the full bolus of. You know, 30 dextrose tablets is not much fun. And I found that really challenging and quite hard to keep my glucose levels up as I was going, even with pumping um, nine. Uh, that amount of dextrose tablets within there. So yeah, that was um, not a fun experience for me. So then at lunchtime, I asked, right, what's the plan? Um, what are we doing here? And they said, right, we're going to have, we're going to set off within the next hour or so, um, around midday, we're going to go up Scarfell Pike. So I was like, okay, that's great. So I reduced my insulin dose by half. Then the plan changed. So now it was it's going to set off more than a couple of hours afterwards. So obviously I'd reduced the insulin dose here you can see that the glucose level has started to go drift up really high and I stayed quite high, 10, 11, 12, until the walk eventually brought it down by the time it'd come back. So some people might think, well, you're only going to 10 or 12, but I don't like to go above 10. What I would have really preferred is to be told the exact timings of when we were going because I would have waited to eat probably until an hour before we went and then done the reduction, so one about that high. But you live and you learn. So what I took it into my own hands for the next time is I made sure as soon as we finished Scarfell Pike before we got to Snowden, I was going to eat and have my insulin three hours before so that there'd be no bolus insulin, there'd be no food knocking about. Therefore, when I started on Snowden, I would only have the basal insulin working and that would make it much easier to manage. And you can see that's what happened here. So I gave my insulin three hours before. Um, way before three hours before we started the insulin and the food had finished and I actually put a temporary basal rate reduction on here and then during the whole walk I only needed about nine nine or ten glucose tablets for the full three hours and managed my glucose levels in target so this was a great lesson around bolus timings and insulin reductions when you're doing a big event like this or you're planning exercise, you really need to think about when am I having my last meal and when am I starting the exercise? Do I need to do bolus reductions or do I need to move my meal three hours before? And I guess this comes to my golden rule with activity now is the three hour rule. If possible, make sure your insulin and your meal is at least three hours before you start activity. Two good reasons for that. One is you're not going to have much insulin knocking about whether the exercise supercharges and also all the carbohydrate and nutrients that you've eaten three hours ago will be in your muscles ready to fuel the activity. Therefore, all you will probably need during the exercise is just a little bit of carbohydrate to keep on top of things. 
If you get in the habit of doing exercise an hour after eating all the time, you're going to have plenty of problems with managing the glucose levels. So for Grace and Jude, we'll certainly be working very hard to make sure that the, the last meal they eat is three hours before, and it's something that I practice all the time. So that's a really important thing to keep in mind. We also have to be mindful with activity and exercises. If the activity is 45 minutes or longer, what happens is all the stored glucose in the muscles and all the stored glucose in the liver get burnt up and used. Therefore, in the seven sort of 11 hours after the activity, the liver starts taking more glucose out of the blood and the side door to the cell stays open so more glucose gets taken up. So there is a risk of dropping low in the seven to 11 hours after, eat, after a, a fairly heavy bout of exercise. And especially if you've done that exercise in the evening, there is a risk of going low overnight. So we have to think about insulin reductions much later after exercise, especially overnight when the exercise has been 45 minutes or more, which we'll plan for. People often ask, and for different weights, how much carbs should I have during exercise? Well, I've done a calculator to make this really easy for you, Grace and Jude, and easy for me. All you enter in is who you are, what activity you're doing, what your weight is, what's your risk of hypos, what type of activity you're doing, what measurement you're using, and what you use for ketones. And it gives you an idea of which types of activities are there. And what it tells you, it gives you the amount of carbs that you would need to manage 20 minutes worth of activity, depending on the glucose level and the trend arrow. So Grace, this is you at 20 kilos. If you were here and then before starting, you were say 5.5 with an arrow across, that's six grams of carbs, two dextrose for 20 minutes. We'd recheck in 20 minutes, and then if you're the same again, we would give another two dextrose. If you drifted up to eight with an arrow trending up, we'd have nothing for 20 minutes and keep a check on it. Best to keep checking every 20 minutes because then you know the glucose that you've had has been absorbed, and also you can keep a regular check as the arrows change. That's the best way to manage activity, and obviously using fast-acting glucose, glucose only, is the best way so you don't end up with loads of sugar stacking in your um digestive tract, the glucose is in quickly and it's in the blood quickly within 20 minutes. So a 20 minute cycle works perfectly. And I've got plenty of these calculators for you as we move along. So in summary for the intro, most exercises drop the glucose level, aerobic and most mixed exercise do, by opening the side door to the cells and sometimes making supercharging the insulin that's around. Very intense activity can lead to the glucose level going up because of stress hormones pushing glucose out of the liver. And really what we need to be thinking about when we move on to plans for aerobic exercise, mixed and anaerobic is, first, what type of activity are we doing? Secondly, when was our last meal in insulin? And ideally keep to the three hour rule so we can take that out of the picture. How long exercise is it gonna be? 45 minutes or more, do we need to worry about going low in the night? And then how much carbs do we need every 20 minutes so we can top up as we need to as we go on? If we can answer those questions as we move forward in this guide, we'll be able to get good starting plans for all types of activity. So let's start with the aerobic and endurance exercise.